Hey everyone, Simon and Anthony here again for the How To Kind of Podcast. And it's the first one we've filmed for a little while. So Anthony, welcome back. How are you? Hey, good, man. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Good to be chatting again. Yeah. The, uh, the topic for today is epilepsy, um, which we know uh, can certainly be helped or, or completely got, omitted or gotten rid of with uh, a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet which is even more effective. Um, So I'm wondering if you might be able to start off by explaining what epilepsy is. Yeah, so so epilepsy is a a medical condition where just essentially people are just more predisposed to having seizures. So they'll they'll have chronic seizures and uh, without medication or intervention of some form or another, uh, they'll, they'll just continue to have seizures. And, and once you have a seizure, mm-hmm. you are more predisposed to having further seizures. Um, specifically, a seizure is uh, overexcitation of your neurons, either mm-hmm. in a focal area or broadly across your whole brain. And, and they present in different ways. So a focal seizure in a certain area, maybe you'll have like little muscle twitches. So your arm's sort of shaking and you're looking at it going, I'm like, I, I'm not doing that. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's, I'm not doing that. And you, and you can't necessarily mm-hmm. stop it. And so just little twitches or even just facial twitches, your face is just twitching and twitching and twitching. That could be a facial, uh, like a focal seizure as well. I mean, it could could also be, you know, low calcium and, uh, and, and, you know, getting a little, you know, uh, areas. Like even, even like maybe muscle fatigue is it sort of sounds similar to, is it kind of like a cramp then? Um, it wouldn't, wouldn't, well, so, so maybe you could get, uh, uh, like the facial twitches, uh, which, which could be similar to cramps. Um, but they're more like spasms that you would get like with low calcium, um yeah you can certainly have that that's just muscular you know just something is going on with the muscle and it's just sort of sort of twitching um but this would be a a little different that you're just you're just you're just moving and you can't stop your body from moving and it's just moving on its own constantly Uh, that can be that could be a seizure um then you have other things like temporal lobe seizures they uh you, you, they could you, you could have those manifest in different ways uh where you're actually experiencing you know different sort of sensations and environment and, and different you know sounds and smells uh and everything like that that are um that are you know not really happening you're experiencing things in a slightly different way so then you get the the uh you can get other ones that are like uh, uh what's called an absent seizure or petite mal seizure where you're just it's like a blank staring episode and the person's unconscious but they're just sitting there and they don't uh they don't really move they don't slump over or anything like that but consciously they, they're not there they just sort of blank out and so you'll try to get their attention you're like hey, what's going on and they're just sitting there staring and wow. uh it's, it's a bit bit scary if you were to find a you know loved one like that and you didn't know what was going on it's also scary for them because they're they they can be aware that they're losing track of time so if you have someone you know if you have a group of people and people sort of sitting there and and you would experience that well maybe you would be you know unconscious essentially for a couple of minutes or a few seconds or whatever but maybe something's different maybe people are talking about a different topic or sitting in different places and you just went whoa, whoa, whoa you were sitting there and you were sitting there and then you know billy's gone like well, what's going on and like and they'll tell you that like oh yeah no billy got up to do this and then we switched because of that and blah 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 and you're realizing like i missed all of that like where where was i um and that can be a sign that you're having some of these staring episodes then there's the the grand mal seizures, the tonic clonic seizures that uh, you know people are more familiar with, where your your entire body is completely rigid. You're shaking and you're arching your back and you bite your tongue and you can and you can damage yourself. You can fall. Obviously, a big risk of seizures is that if you're driving mm-hmm. or you or you're on a ladder or even just walking around, you will clench up and you will fall or you will crash or you will come off a ladder and you can, you can seriously harm yourself. That's why, you know, it's a law in Australia and in the U S that if you have a seizure, you can't legally drive for a certain period of time. It's usually six months, uh, seizure free. And that's because if you were to have a seizure while, while driving a car, that would be very, very dangerous. You know, like there's a high chance of, of someone dying, you, you and some, and other people. So it's, you know, it's very dangerous, but, you know, I always, always advise people that, you know, it, the reason that we're, you know, it's the law that you can't drive is, is because of that, because of that risk, but you should also take that principle home with you and other things and just think about them. Cause you know, if you're, you know, and think about it, it's like, you know, if I had were to have a seizure right now, would that end really badly? 
Yeah. You know, if you're driving a car and you're having a seizure, would that end really badly? Yes. Climbing a ladder, like you said. Like, yeah, exactly. Climbing a ladder, swimming in the ocean. Yeah, true. You know? You're, yeah. you're going to sink down in a, in a swimming pool with other people. You swink down. Well, you know, you're, you. you know, maybe someone might be able to help you if you're in the ocean and it's murky, probably not, you know? And so, uh, even a pool, I mean, that would be, that would be probably a bad idea. Yeah. But, um, certainly so alone it would be. <clears throat> and so all these things, you know, going up on the roof to clean the gutters, you know, that would end badly. And so it's that, it's that principle is that if you have a seizure, then, uh, then you're in trouble. And, and again, so one seizure can be get more seizures. So if you, if you were to have a seizure that, that will predispose you to having more seizures. And so it's really important to sort of get on top of those. Uh, Why is that? Um, you know, it, you're just, it, I, I don't know fully. I don't know if that's, that's perfectly understood, but it's, it's, it's probably to do with your, your sort of your electrically priming yourself uh, to have these things. And so you're, you're, you know, triggering something in your brain, you're having this big, basically over excitation and, and it'll, it'll sort of electric uh, currents are changing in your brain as well. And that could make it easier for you to get back in that state again in the future. Just like if you get hit by lightning, you actually charge yourself in a way that you're more likely to be hit by lightning in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of think of it like that, but that may not oh, yeah. be an actual accurate description physiologically, but that's sort of the way I think about it. Um, that's, you know, that's kind yeah. of interesting. I didn't realize you were actually more likely if you've been hit by lightning once. Oh yeah. 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 Well, that's what they say. You know, it's like, Oh, light, you know, light, you know, it's not going to strike twice or something like that. Uh, actually, likely to actually in striking once. yeah, I think it was, um, was it Chichi Rodriguez or something like that? Maybe I'm getting the name wrong, but it was a golfer. It was a pro golfer and he, um, and he got hit by lightning on the golf course. And then he was out again and he got hit again. Oh, man. So like anytime the clouds roll in, he's like, yep, screw it. And he just like, <laughs> just tosses his clubs. Like, yep, I'm out. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so, and he just gets out of there. Cause he's just like this, you know, he's like a, you know, a lightning rod. Out there. Yeah, <laughs> this like, lightning rod. <laughs> oh. oh man. That's funny. So, yeah. So that, yeah, that's what, that's what epilepsy is. And, um, and obviously, you know, seizures are, are very, very, hard to deal with. They're very difficult. They're hard on your body. You can, oh, they can be fatal, even just, even without falling or crashing your car, a uh, seizure can kill you. And so if that's not reversed, you go into what's called status epilepticus, where you, you, uh, you're not able to get out of a seizure and, you know, and, and unless you are given a lot of different drugs, it's, um, you know, you can, you can die from that. Um, if you, the longer you're in a seizure and having like a, you know, a, a well, grand mal tonic clonic seizure, the harder it is for your body to stop naturally. So you get over five minutes, basically it's going to be difficult. It's less and less likely that you're going to stop that, uh, on your own, that you'll need, um, intervention with, uh, medications. Yeah. I think it'd be very sick. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's actually, um, uh, one of the ways, you know, I, I mentioned hemlock, uh, you know, the North American, I think it's like water hemlock is one of the most dangerous plants in the world and certainly in North America and how that kills you is it, it, it just trashes your brain. It's just like a neurotoxin and it puts you into seizures and you have such outrageous seizures that you will die in a couple of minutes from the seizures that it gives you. Shit. Um, so at, at outside of hemlock, do we know what's, what's causing the seizures or epilepsy? Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's going to be multifactorial because you can have a lot of different causes of, of seizures. You can have, uh, you know, brain injuries. That's the, the number one risk factor for developing epilepsy is trauma, you know, tra you know traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, also having like a lesion. So if you have like a, a tumor or either cancer or benign in your brain, that's causing pressure that can sort of, you know, trip up uh, the, the normal workings of your brain and predispose you or at least increase your risk of having seizures. And, you know, having a you know, bleed or all these sorts of things. These all do that. This is why when someone comes in, they have a, 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 an, a, an extreme insult uh, to their brain, either from injury or from tumors. We put people on uh, anti-epileptic medication, even if they haven't had a seizure, or if we do brain surgery and we're cutting into the brain, we will put them on seizure prophylaxis, uh, usually for about a week. Usually that's enough that, you know, you're more, you're at more risk at the beginning of that. And that you know, exponentially decreases as you go. And so after about a week or so, uh, you're, you know, pretty good mm -hmm. odds to be out of that window. 
So there are a lot of things that can cause that. But, you know, just people just having epilepsy all on their own, there could be, you know, genetic issues, there could be uh, structural issues, they could have had an injury or an insult. And, and, but, you know, one of the interesting things is that food certainly affects this. Now we know about, you know, the hemlock that causes seizures. Well, that, you know, who's to say there isn't, there aren't other things in plants and different toxins that will cause that as well. We certainly know that there are a lot of neurotoxins uh, out there that are, that have been developed over, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of years to stop insects and animals from eating these plants. And they were designed in order to do that. And, and maybe they were designed to, you know, ward off an insect and we're not an insect. So it doesn't quite work like that with us, but you know, things like caffeine, I've, I've spoken to people with epilepsy and they have, uh, they've said that that has been a big trigger for them is, is caffeine. And they sort of think of caffeine as a neurotoxin. And so, you know, and we do know that a ketogenic diet has actually been used clinically for roughly 90 years to treat uh, epilepsy. And, uh, and, and it's actually still very effective and it's still used in top centers such as Johns Hopkins. I was reading a study about them. They've had, you know, a, a number of um, publications over the years where they're just saying like, yeah, this is actually still a good treatment modality. We still use this. Here's a case series of people. And these are the benefits that they, that they got from that. Um, I was, Hopkins, I was, is that, is that an Australian hospital, right? Johns Hopkins. No, that's in, that's in Baltimore. That's America. So that's, a, that's one of the top, um, hospitals and, uh, was one of the top universities, medical schools and hospitals in the world. And, um, so that's, that's where really having no idea, but yeah, cause it was yeah, familiar, no, but I was like, is that Australian? Yeah. yeah okay, cool. Yeah, um, no, and they're one of the, one of the top you know, neurological centers, and certainely neurosurgical centers. That they would absolutely be, uh, you know, uh, you know, if not number one, the number one neurosurgical center, uh, pretty close to it. Um, mm -hmm. That's where you know people like um, you know Ben Carson, uh, who uh, you know was was the first neurosurgeon to successfully separate conjoined twins at the head. Wow. Um, yeah. That's where he was. He was um, uh, head of uh, pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins for decades, you know, and he, he was just, you know, really, you know, probably the most famous neurosurgeon of his time and, 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 and deservedly so. And, uh, and a very interesting guy he has a very interesting backstory. He's written a number of books on that. He even had a movie made about him with Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. played him in his life story. I was a pretty, pretty badass. And, um, and it's called Gifted Hands. It's just, a, it's a very, very, I mean, it's probably one of the more inspirational stories you'll ever see, you know, someone coming from, from extreme poverty and, and extreme, um, conditions in like, you know, a very rough area of Detroit and just, just working it uh, as, as just working his ass off and, and getting into, um, uh, Yale on a scholarship. I believe he was on a scholarship and then I don't think he would have been able to pay yeah. for it otherwise, because he, he, he did come from very humble means, but, uh, and then, you know, got into, to Yale, uh, medical school and then accepted into Johns Hopkins, uh, neurosurgical program. And he was, so good that when he finished his residency program, they made him head of pediatric neurosurgery and like well, straight, that away. Doesn't, straight away, you know? And so like that, that doesn't happen. It's, it's uh, I believe it was straight away. I really, it was just, I think he was like 32. I got to see this movie now. So, yeah. Yeah. You check it out. Yeah. That's no, it's good. And um, so that's, that's, that's really one of the top centers and, and they use this. Um, it is surprising to me that, that more neurologists aren't, using this at least as like a first line now if someone can't can't stick to it uh, you know and i've spoken to people like well you know yes we do know it actually has you know very good evidence for it and it's very helpful in seizures but you know it's it you know people like carbs and so they want to do it and and i think that's kind of giving up i think you should at least try because you know you know something works and it's and it's and it's not a bunch of heavy medications that are that are going to have all their own side effects. Oh, and, man, you know, totally. and also, also you're a doctor and a patient. <laughs> you. Like they probably take you seriously. So give them the best advice you've got. Yeah. You know, don't, don't just assume that they're going to go for donuts uh, instead of eating meat when you haven't even given it a try. You know, most most people yeah. really trust their doctor, particularly when they're in a vulnerable position like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and that's why I, I always uh you know have a lot of of um regard and respect when i'm uh, for people when i'm when i'm speaking to them because the, you know they are 
you know, hurt and they're scared and they're, and they're worried and they need help. And so, you know, you have to have that frame of mind that that's, that's why these people are coming to you. And so, you know, it, it just helps you take that um, as seriously as you should. And, and you're right. People do listen. You know, when I, when I see people that have been having seizures, you know, in, in the brain surgery setting, they've just had you know, seizures since this sort of thing happened. I just sort of, you know, I will mention it. And I was like, oh, well, actually, you know, this has been shown for you know, decades that this, this is really helpful. And they're like, really like, wow, that, that would be great. And, um, and, and some of them try it and they have great results. And I've had a number of people, uh, contact me, um, you know, you know, based on, on, on that and, you know, mentioning that in other, uh, other talks and uh, them trying it or maybe you know just coming across it on their own and and then saying like wow actually you know i really you know i had that same experience like i'm off all my medications and i, I was on like five different medications and you know just could i was just having still having seizures and then i went ketogenic and like i was able to come off most of my medications and i was i was able to control it with far fewer and then they went carnivore and then they really got rid of everything and they and at least for the, for these people they have not had seizures since then. I'm not saying that that will happen for everyone and, you know, sort of lesional seizures, like, you know, something like you have a tumor there pushing on things that, you know, you may still have, have issues with that, but it will certainly reduce them and make them far better to control. Absolutely. I have, I have no qualm saying that definitively. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, and some things, you know, uh, like temporal lobe epilepsy, where you have this nidus of tissue that's just freaking out for some reason, and that's sparking these seizures. Um, uh, I don't think it's as effective for them, but uh, that's key, ketogenic. I don't, you know, there's no temporal studies. Lobe, which, which part of your brain is the temporal lobe? Right there. But that's, uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's your, your sort of your, te your temporal bones in there, but that's, that's where... Um, you would call this like the temporalis muscle. So we call this your temple. Yeah. Right? Very sensitive. And yeah. And so, yeah, you have that, that the temporalis muscle there, which is, you know, makes you clench your jaw. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of bones there that, that meet of different, uh, um, just like sort of suture lines where all, like the different frontal bone, temporal bone, parietal bone, they all sort of meet right there. And, uh, and it's thinner. And so, and because these are where bones are meeting and knitting together, it's sort of a, a weak spot. It's like a, you know, a, you know, a, um, uh, crease or whatever, I'm, I'm blanking on the, uh, seam and, um, oh, yeah. and so it's gonna be a little weaker and there's like a big artery that runs behind there. Oh. And so it's like, yeah, per, it's just, you know, if, if we're, you were thinking about how to design a person worse, like you, you probably couldn't come up with too many better places, worse places to like put that little artery. And so you get it a knock there and it's weaker. And so it kind of fractures in and just slices that, uh, that artery there. And so you get these, this, this is, this is why the, the advice is that if you have a bad head injury, especially if you lose consciousness, um, or you get a concussion or whatever, uh, that you shouldn't go to sleep for eight hours is because if you've cracked that bone and that sort of sheared that vessel, then it's going to present sort of in the next eight hours because it's, it's an arterial bleed and it's going to start putting pressure in your brain and it, and it is high pressure because it's coming from the artery. So it's, you're going to see it fast. And so you shouldn't go to sleep because you need someone there to monitor you to see if you start going goofy and, and see if you, you know, start, you know, slipping into a coma because of the pressure on your brain. And if you're already asleep, they're like, Oh, they're just sleeping. You know, they're, they're comfortable. And then you try to wake them up in the morning and they're, they're not waking up, you know, they're in a coma. So that's, that's why specifically if you get hit in the temple and you get, uh, you know, bad injury there or knocked out or whatever, uh, that's, that's the danger thing. You know, if you get hit in other parts of, of the head, probably still good advice to just stay awake for a while and have someone keep an eye on you. So you don't start getting goofy. Uh, yeah. but that's specifically what it is. It's specifically for an injury right there above the temporal lobe. Yeah. I mean, you can just feel in your own head, like so much stronger in the, in the forehead yeah. or even the back of the head. I know whiplash yeah. is terrible, but at least it's less, it feels like it's less likely to crack anything. Well, it's, it is much thicker. And when you're, and when you're cutting through uh, the skull to access the brain, there are just areas of, of the skull that are just thicker. And, and this is a very thin part. And so we would, we actually access this, it's called the keyhole is going right there because you, you sort of go there. That's the key to several different areas and, and uh, fossa in the brain or in the, in the skull that you can access different areas uh, of, uh, of the brain and even, even the eye. And so that right there, when you're sort of drilling that down, I mean, it's, it's a couple of millimeters, 
you know, mm-hmm. over there. So that, that bone is very, very thin, a couple millimeters thick. And then you go over here and, you know, it can be like a centimeter, yeah. you know, and then other, other people, you know, um, you know, people from, you know, like sub-Saharan Africa or, um, uh, Aboriginal, um, Australians, uh, their, their, their skulls are much thicker, much, much thicker. And so when you're, you're doing surgery on these and you're trying to do a burr hole and you're trying to get in there, you know, some, sometimes you have these craniotomes that, that sort of drill out uh, an area. So you, you, you drill a little hole and then you stick this saw in there and you should, can sort of, you know, drill it out. Um, That's insane. Take off a bone yeah. flap. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, so I've, I've seen guys that are, that have their skulls are thick enough that we can't actually use the craniotome. Like it won't work. It's so, it's so thick. And so it takes a lot longer to get that piece of bone off. And, um, you know, you know, when you're working on a, on a time crunch, they've got this big bleed or pressure or something like that. Like, you know, it gets, it gets a bit anxious because you're like, Ooh, shoot, this is, you know, this is taking longer than I want it to, yeah. you know? And but I reckon I could do with a bit more thickness in my skull. Like I've had, I've had a few passions and I reckon yeah. if it was twice as thick, it just wouldn't have been such an issue, you know? Well, you know, the thing is too, is that like, um, you know, the skull, is um is one part of it but also it's just your, your brain sitting in uh, cerebrospinal fluid and it's just sort of floating there right and so if you get a knock you just like you know like shaking baby syndrome you're shaking that around that's going to damage the brain and so you know it, you you bang your head you, you it, the problem is is not that your your skull has let you down and shattered in and smashed into your um, brain yeah, yeah. it's that you've hit with such force and now your brain is rattling around in your skull and it's smacking against the walls of the skull. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you're sort you're sort of going to get a, a, a brain injury either way, but yeah. We should do, we, let's do an episode on uh, like neurosurgery, uh, and that kind of like more technical side, like how you were talking about, like soaring through the skull and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very fascinating topic. <laughs> uh, um, just wanted to like, we talked about uh, that seizures are caused by overexcitement um, mm-hmm. of neurons. It, it, it just, for my simple brain, it just seems so obvious that when you have caffeine, like you said, the caffeine can be a trigger. Like I can mm-hmm. feel when I have a lot of caffeine that my, I don't know, my neurons or my brain is overexcited. Uh, and I suppose you could say the same thing about having a lot of sugar, that um, mm-hmm. it does feel like a, you know, a quite an intense kind of bright burning light has sort of come on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that might be advantageous for some things mm-hmm. like, you know, for example, uh, like if you really need to study or smash something out like short term, I think that can kind of be helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it makes sense to me that that, that that would be a trigger actually. Oh my God. Imagine, um, ecstasy or cocaine, <laughs> like yeah. talk about neurons firing. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, when, when you, when you have sugar and that sort of turns the lights on, you know, that that's uh, dopamine, you know, mm-hmm. your, uh, you know, which is an excitatory molecule. It, it turns on other molecules, makes them go. And so, yeah, you get too much of that. You can, you can have a problem. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, um, there's, um, you know, that and dopamine has a, has a lot of different things, but like different, you know, interestingly, like Parkinson's is you're not having enough dopamine. And so you can't like initiate movement. And so you just don't have enough, you know, you don't have enough dopamine to tell these things to go. Right. And so it's, it's harder to get going. Um, and then schizophrenia uh, seems to be influenced by dopamine as well, by having too much to having, having too much dopamine. And so the treatment for Parkinson's is trying to increase the amount of dopamine or the efficacy of dopamine in your brain, or even supplying dopamine in the form of, of uh, carbidopa um, or levodopa as, as it can be called. <clears throat> and, um, and, and so increasing that amount of, of dopamine uh, to help them sort of move more. And if you get too much of that, you can actually start displaying schizophrenic experiences and, and uh, having sort of psychotic breaks uh, or, or hallucinations. And the flip side of that is that people with schizophrenia, they're giving, getting medication, they're trying to dampen down that dopamine response. And so that reduces their uh, you know, hallucinations and experiences brought about by schizophrenia. But if they get too much of that, they actually start um, displaying Parkinson-like 
uh, features. So it, it's sort of interesting. There's more going on to it than that. I don't think it's as simple as that, but that's a major contributing factor. So yeah, do dopamine plays a big role in your brain. And so that's why people, uh, you know, try to take drugs and different things that increase dopamine, cocaine, heroin, uh, uh, methamphetamines, and uh, sugar, you know, fructose specifically, they all uh, give a dopamine response to your brain, to the addiction centers of your brain. You're like, your brain's like, yeah, I like that. Let's do that again. Um, and so that, that's why they can be you know, you know, neurochemically uh, addictive. Hey guys, happy to announce that we have a new sponsor, uh, our first ever sponsor for the show, and it's the Carnival Bar, which is a product that Anthony and I, and I both really enjoy and totally believe in. Yeah. So yeah, the carnival, carnival bar is really good because it's just meat and fat. It doesn't have any of the extra nonsense. You, you can get it with salt, which I actually like, uh, and you can get it with honey. Obviously that's not uh, uh, what I go for, but you have it with, with the ones that have just pure meat and fat and then meat, fat and uh, water. And so it's really good just to, because it's portable. It's pemmican. Basically, this is what the native Americans would use uh, when they would you know, run the herd of Buffalo off a cliff and they would just preserve the meat that way. It's the same thing. And so this, has, uh, I think I calculated before where it's something like three quarters of a pound of uh, pemmican has 2000 calories. And so if you're, you're hiking or backpacking or something like that, and you're worried about pack weight, 10 pounds of pemmican is two weeks of perfect nutrition, you know, at 2000 calories a day. So, you know, it's not something that, that you would just eat uh, as, as a meal, uh, but, uh, you know, because it, you know, it is more expensive than just buying meat. So if you have meat, just eat meat, but this is something that's great on the go, something you can bring to work. Or, you know, if you're doing like a, I like, you know, uh, training fasted and performing fasted. Some people like doing like ultra marathon things or, you know, Ironman things, and they want to eat halfway through. This is perfect for that. You know, going hiking, you're not going to bring a Tupperware, you know, container full of, of cut up steak, but mm -hmm. you can bring a carnivore bar and you can bring two, and then you're going to have perfect nutrition for your entire endeavor. And, you know, with, with hardly any, uh, you know, size restrictions. Um, going out for dinner and don't want to gorge on all the crapola that everybody orders, you eat a carnival bar on the way, keeping your handbag in your pocket and you're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if you're in a situation where you do want to eat and you don't have access to something, you know, that, that it would be uh, in keeping with what you want to eat, you know, this is a perfect, uh, this is a perfect, uh, uh, you know, um, option for that. And I think I heard about Jordan Peterson carrying steak around in his product, in his pocket. If he yeah. needs a carnival bar, he'd have a carnival yeah. bar in his pocket. It's less messy. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll cut up a steak and put it into, uh, you know, a Tupperware thing. And, uh, and bring that with me or like a tea. I've been known to like cook a T-bone and, uh, and just eat that in the car, like a popsicle and just like, you know, just like have a car steak, but that's not necessarily, you know, some people are, are less, uh, you know, savage than that. And they just want to do something normal, but, um, you know, you can always bring, you can always bring a steak to work or, or some, or, or on the go, but sometimes it's just, it's just very inconvenient. Sometimes you just want to grab something and have it ready to go. And, you know, I've certainly done that when I'm on call and I'm running out to the hospital, when I'm like, damn it, I really want to eat. You know, I, I do grab one and I'll have that out the door. I did that, you know, last night when I was on call. So it's something that's, that's very convenient. It tastes good. It's sort of got a crunch to it. That is like a, just a nice different texture. And that's one thing that people have uh, spoken to me about that. They really like the different textures and they want something salty and crunchy like chips. You know, they were talking specifically about chips, but this is salty and crunchy. It's something different and it's, uh, and it's enjoyable. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't just eat them like you're eating, you know, you know, uh, a meal, but I would absolutely, I absolutely have these and use these um, for those occasions that they are just very convenient and they are. 100%. So go and get yourself a carnival bar. But in, in the context of seizures, um, you know, we do know that, you know, you know, again, like we, when you eliminate carbohydrates, you, you are significantly benefiting, uh, your, your epilepsy or your seizures and you are, are, are re significantly reducing your risk for having future seizures. Uh, I was talking to professor Ben Vickman at uh, BYU and, uh, you know, he, he was talking about it as well. And now he's been doing research on, on insulin and metabolism for well over 15 years. And, you know, he's a professor of, of biochemistry and, and, and bioenergetics, I, I think is the, um, his title, but you know, I, I could, I could be mistaken there, but anyway, he's a professor at, at BYU and does a ton of research on this. And, you know, he was saying, you know, we were talking about that, uh, phenomenon where if you go on a ketogenic diet, 
you know, this significantly helps that. And he was saying that, um, that, that people, people on, uh, um, for, for epilepsy specifically, it seemed to do, they actually seemed to be helped by the amount of ketones that they had. And they actually wanted higher ketones, you know, so eating more, you know, fatty meat, that's going to bump up your ketones. And that, that for them was actually even more protective that not just being in, uh, you know, the, the correct metabolic state and not, you know, dumping a bunch of sugar into your brain, but having it run on ketones, which it prefers as, as Ben Bickman said, like, you know, when you're going into you know, like a ketogenic state or, you know, just your normal metabolism, which is called the fasting metabolism, but I disagree with that. I think that that's our primary metabolic state. That's, that's where our body and biochemistry work much better. And when your, your blood sugar is sort of going down and, and you're, it's not being just stuffed into every orifice um, by insulin, you know, it starts coming down and then your ketones are even like, you have like, a, you know, somebody, I forget the exact amount, but you have something like a quarter of the amount of, uh, of ketones as you do glucose, all of a sudden your brain just goes, yep, that's what I want. And it only runs on ketones. You know, it just, it just throws the glucose away. And so when your brain is preferentially using ketones, even when there are less ketones than glucose available, that lets you know that that's, that's your brain's primary energy source. And even when you're in a the so-called fed state, which is your carbohydrate insulin driven state, which is, I think is a pathological state. And you have constantly chronically too high of uh, blood sugar and your insulin is just stuffing it into your brain and other parts of your, of your body. Um, even then your brain still runs on some ketones. Your brain never doesn't run on ketones. It will always have some ketones uh, that it runs on because it needs them. And that's what it wants to run on. So if there's any ketones available, you know, it's using them. And then when it gets just en enough ketones, it's just like, yeah, yeah, we're only using that. And it just shuts down uh, the glucose, even when it's available. So um, that was very interesting to me. And specifically with, with epilepsy, you know, being in a ketogenic state, preferably a carnivore state was, was helpful. And then just having higher ketones was seemed to be uh, added to that. And that that was, that was a protective thing to the brain. Your brain is getting its preferred and primary energy source. And that seems to make a big difference in epilepsy. Is that, is that linked to, I've heard people talk about therapeutic ketones before or ther therapeutic mm. ketosis. Are you, are you familiar with that at all? No, I don't, I don't know what that refers to. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it's something like that, that they, you know, they, they've uh, improved uh, their life by, by going on a ketogenic diet and, and getting their ketones up. Because, you know, when you go on a ketogenic diet, a lot of people will think of that as the ketones. I need my ketones up. I need my ketones up. I need to be in ketosis. And they're checking their, their, they're getting monitors and things like that. I think that if you're eating naturally, you don't need to do that. You know, we didn't have these monitors even 20 years ago, maybe, well, maybe 20 years ago, but not really before that. Mm -hmm. And certainly not a hundred years ago or a hundred thousand years ago. And so, you know, life just worked. Okay. So you can, if you're eating what you're supposed to eat, life will just work yeah. and um, you don't need to micromanage anything. And, uh, you know, and that goes for ketones as well. Mm -hmm. However, um, it, you know, from what <clears throat> uh, professor Bickman was saying, you know, uh, that, that people with epilepsy <clears throat> are benefited by, by having higher ketones and not just being in ketosis, but having a higher level of ketones. That seems, that's, that's that seems kind of like, I was about to ask about that. Like, uh, 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 people with epilepsy being prescribed exogenous ketones. Maybe, you know, that, that, well, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting thing to do. So even people that they're like, yeah, I can't do carnivore, I can't do uh, keto, maybe, you know, taking in uh, exogenous ketones, mm -hmm. your, your brain would potentially, uh, you know, <clears throat> kick over and just start using those as well. Now, yeah, maybe, you know, and I, and I do know people that like take like ketones and like, yeah, my brain just wakes up. I feel really good, but you know, they're not on a, a full carnivore diet. Yeah, that's right. And, um, have you, you know, so have I, I don't know if that would make a difference for them though, but yeah, maybe, <laughs> but, but you know, that'd be really interesting with someone with a standard American diet, you know, Western yeah. diet where they're eating carbohydrates and doing that, you know, would that kick over and, and have your brain running on that? How often would you have to eat them? How often you have to take them? Like what doses that'd be, I think that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, would that help uh, with, um, with, with your epilepsy, that'd be very interesting, but, um, you could be, you'd be easier and it would be easier and, and you'd be better served by just, you know, just, just getting rid of that crap anyway. And, and just, and just eating what you're supposed to eat anyway. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's, I mean, that's kind of one thing that we talk about all the time. It's like, there are so many of these like band-aid measures that you <clears throat> put in place because you're doing damage at the root of things. 
And, yeah. and that would be an example of that. So that's not ideal. But on the topic of exogenous ketones, have, have you taken them before? No, I, I, haven't, I haven't taken them before. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a big proponent of just, just letting, letting your body do its thing. And um, so I don't uh, take that. You know, I, I, I don't take supplements. I don't take vitamins. I don't take things like that. Yeah. I get everything I need from meat. The one thing that, you know, I, I do qualify that with is if I'm not getting in the sun because I just, you know, I get up before, you know, I, I'm at work before it's light out. I'm leaving after it's dark again. Like I just, I'm just not getting in the damn sun. And so, you know, I'm not going to get um, the vitamin D that I, that I want to be at the levels that I, um, you know, feel are most beneficial um, in that regard. You will get vitamin D from animal fat and, um, you know, butter and things like that. Um, but, you know, if I'm not getting in the sun, you know, sometimes I'll take, I'll take uh, some vitamin D3, uh, but that's really it. And, uh, you know, I don't think that you, I'm not too worried about like what my ketone levels are just because whatever, whatever they are, they're, they're physiological. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if I had epilepsy for some reason, and, and I found that that to be beneficial, great. You know, I think, I think if someone's doing that and they're doing carnivore already, and it's not quite getting rid of all their, uh, seizures, try it, you know, see how it goes. You know, it may, it may well, uh, be beneficial and that would be, uh, very interesting and it could be very beneficial to that person. I, mm -hmm. I don't, think that I need that. I think that I'm, that, you know, I'm, I'm good just getting, uh, what I need from meat. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm the same with you. I, I feel the same. And I think taking exogenous ketones would seem to be not necessary. Like why don't you just get to the core of things, but I have taken them before and, mm. um, I took some, the brand's called prove it, prove it ketones. And, yeah. uh, first of all, it tastes really nice. It's like, it's like salty and sweet <laughs> in a drink. Yeah. Um, but it's really, it's really intense. Um, so like if you take ketones in the morning, like maybe instead of having a coffee, you go into like, obviously a really deep state of ketosis fast, like faster than you would if you were just doing a little bit of fasting and eating fatty meat, you, you actually go a little bit quicker. Um, and it's, it's really intense, like probably too intense. You feel like you can concentrate really, really well. Um, and I know that a lot of people, I'm not recommending this. A lot of people have had success losing weight on mm. on prove it on ketones um because you take that in the morning you take some at lunchtime you do not need to eat and your, yeah. <laughs> your brain is absolutely firing so it's basically like a really it's like a hack to fasting like i would maybe recommend it to somebody who has a lot of fat to lose and like has trouble you know managing their diet but then the idea is to get off them not to be on them mm. the whole time but you could easily mm. take um, ketones twice a day and then only have to eat one meal a day and then you would lose. And if, you know, if you're just eating meat for dinner, yeah. then you'd lose body fat pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would worry that, you know, if you're, if you're doing that and you're just sort of supplying this energy and it is energy, so it's going to have like, you know, calorie nutrition in that sense, but you know, you, you maybe you might be losing out on, on the other things that, that meat brings you. And if you're, you're sort of if your body's saying, like, oh yeah, I know we're good on energy, like everything's fine, you don't need to eat. You know, are you losing out on other nutrients or things that your body Definitely. might have wanted otherwise? Totally. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, because that's not that's certainly not something we've ever supplemented with before, and that that hasn't come across. We haven't come across just a, a natural source of ketones apart from animal fat in the wild. A little, uh, a little sachet, you know, just a little ketone sachet fat in the bush. Yeah, yeah, just growing off of uh, yeah. you know, like, you know, like a keto fountain or something. <laughs> just, the ketones just pouring down, and um, you know, so you know, I, I'm happy just sort of just doing things physiologically and biochemically. That's interesting, though. Um, that sweet flavor is that is that from artificial sweeteners yeah. or what? Do I have? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Okay, uh, I would certainly want to avoid those. Anyway, oh, I don't recommend anyone listen to this. Does that? I'm just saying. That's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's just your experience. No, it's interesting though, you know, and, and you're just sort of, you know, just mainlining your brain's fuel source, you know, it's, yeah. that's, uh, that's not an unreasonable, you know, response to that is your brain just goes, Oof. Ooh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just hear, you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, and, and that's the thing too, you know, you, you know, uh, you're really just going for the source there. Like, this is just, this is just energy you're just taking in pure energy um and you're not taking in all the other things and i think that's um you know specifically with with carnivore versus a keto keto diet is that is that difference is that you're eliminating more things out on a carnivore diet and i've certainly spoken to people that have um you know had had a better time with carnivore 
uh, versus keto for their epilepsy. Like, you know, it'd be like on you know, five different medications and, and, and still having seizures. And then they discover keto and, and, um, and then they're like, they're coming off all their medications. They're maybe on only like one or two now and they're doing much better, or maybe they, you know, they're off their medications, but they still have a seizure every now and then. And so they're still on an, an agent for that. Um, and then they go carnivore and then that's it. And they haven't had a seizure since. And that's not necessarily everyone's going to have that experience, but these people certainly did. And, you know, carbohydrates are going to screw these things up. It's going to screw up, you know, the energy metabolism in your brain. And for some reason that, that kicks off epilepsy and those that are susceptible to it and, or can anyway. And so eliminating that you're just, you're just eliminating one of these triggers, but there are other triggers. And so, you know, caffeine being one of those things. And so, you know, if caffeine is one of those things and hemlock is one of those things and carbohydrates are one of those things, all of which are come from plants, really, then you know, even honey comes from plants because that's just concentrated nectar that the bees puked up, you know? And so, you know, that comes from a flower, really. Um, Heard all it these things. First. What's that? Heard it here first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it makes, makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, I don't see yeah. how it can be carnivore just because uh, just because a bee takes it from a plant and then puts it in their hive. How does that suddenly make it that you're eating an animal? We'll, we'll think about this, right? You know, a, a cow eats grass and then basically pukes back the, the cud into their mouth and they chew that more and then they swallow it again, right? So if you took that cud, would that, would that be an animal product? Is that a cow now? No, you know, it's, it's what the cow is eating to make a cow, right? So the bee is eating nectar to then puke up honey and have a store so that they can eat that later. And that feeds bees. And then you eat the bee that if, if you wanted to eat, you know, sort of uh, you know, animal based or carnivore, you'd eat the bee. You wouldn't eat the bee vomit. You wouldn't eat the bee food, you know? And so, you know, if you, if you just sort of think about it that way, you know, it makes more sense that that's, that's not an animal product. And you, you, you don't get honey. Also, you don't get honey from milking a bee. Just to be really yeah, exactly. clear, <laughs> that's why dairy is slightly different because yeah. it's like you know, yeah. and, and you don't get <laughs> almond milk from milking almonds either. What? Yeah, <laughs> little almond nipples. <laughs> and, um, but uh, yeah, so you know, like carbohydrates, you know, these things come from plants predominantly. Obviously, you know, animal, you know, meat has glycogen and, and certain carbohydrate stores as well. But you know, the, the main sources of carbohydrates you know, come from plants. You know, coffee, caffeine comes from plants, you know, water, you know, water hemlock is obviously a plant and there, I don't know what the chemical is there in there that triggers these seizures, but they're severe. And so, you know, that, that is that, are those the only three things in the plant world that are going to do that? Probably not. And so you're probably going to have other triggers as well in, in, you know, plants and vegetables. And so that is, you know, carbohydrates are a major trigger, but there are other triggers. And so, you know, going on a ketogenic diet does help significantly. We've known this for 90 years and, but coming off these other things as well and getting rid of those triggers as well is, is going to help even more. And maybe you, you don't have, you know, I was talking to, um, uh, you know, Nate, the bodybuilder from Reno, uh, had him on uh, the show a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago and, and he what? cured his epilepsy. Oh, really? Wow. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And so he was, he was seizure free just from, from keto. And then he, you know, went on, um, you know, a carnivore and he got even better. I mean, he didn't have any seizures on keto. So he was already good from that standpoint, but his health benefits his you know, depression, anxiety, and other things were, were just completely gone, uh, after he went full carnivore and, you know, he's, he's, you know, breaking records in, uh, weightlifting in, in, uh, Nevada. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, it's not like as big of a lifting, uh, culture and, uh, competition as like California would be, but he is still breaking records in, in Nevada. And he's, he's really just, just getting going with a carnivore, uh, uh, weightlifting set. And he's, and he's just accelerating so much faster than other people are. So I think, I think he's going to do very, very well if he, um, you know, keeps it up and, and, and keeps uh, competing, but yeah, he, he got rid of his seizures and, you know, those other, other people that I've spoken to, where they were on like five different agents and they still were having seizures. You know, that does happen. It's, it's rare, but it does happen. They were never told or even suggested like, Hey, you know, you're a difficult case. This is really bad. You know, it's something that would help or could help mm -hmm. just don't eat carbs and sugar. It was never suggested to them. Like these guys have to figure it out themselves. And, you know, and then they, they do, and they, they have good, good outcomes from it. You know, 
try? Like, why aren't they trying? I, I, I know that, that some are, and I know that there are neurologists who do uh, re recommend that, but I, I, would, I would have thought that this would be, you know, part of the, you know, the canon of, of treating epilepsy is, you know, is saying, hey, you can give this a try. You know, if it doesn't work, if you can't do it and you can't maintain it, that's fine. But there's good evidence uh, that this helps with epilepsy. And especially when you get someone who's on five medications or, or, you know, multiple medications, more than one, that's a difficult case, you know, and that's, and that's, that person's having a hard time and they are at high risk uh, for, for death, you know, because they could have a seizure at any time and any seizure could be fatal. Any seizure could be your last night. And that's sort of a scary thing to say. Um, and, and, you know, the majority of seizures are not fatal, but you, you never know, you don't know. And you don't know if you just have a seizure and you just fall and you crack your head on the corner of a table and that's it, you know, you don't know. And so that's sort of the worrying thing about epilepsy and having seizures. And so just at least trying that or suggesting it and just say, Hey, by the way, this could help, you know, I, I think that it would be I just think it, it should just be part of normal practice to at least suggest it and recommend it. And then, and then the patient can do what they want. It's their body. It's their life. You know, if they just go, yeah, you know, you know, having, you know, having seizures is, uh, is, is small change compared to giving up pizza. Fine. You know, that's your, you know, it's your decision, but you know, I, I, a lot of people would give it a shot. A lot of people do not like the fact that they have seizures, do not like the fact that they have to take medications. Mm -hmm. They don't. I mean, so I'm sort of thinking about like um, thinking about like a doctor who might be hesitant to suggest, hey, go on a ketogenic diet. It's going to help with your epilepsy. I'm guessing the ones that are hesitant would be either the ones that maybe the ones that aren't sort of very don't care very much, so they're happy to just prescribe the standard remedy, but put them to side to the side. There'd probably be some who would say, oh no, I can't go ahead and encourage you to consume a lot of saturated fat and not eat your veggies. Um, I just don't feel morally comfortable with that. Um, and, you know, I, my, I, I, to, to that sort of response, which I assume is, is what they would say, you know, I say, oh, but you do feel comfortable recommending these prescription drugs and chemicals that they could be on for the rest of their life, right. that they have to pay for for the rest of their life as well, um, mm -hmm. that are made in like a laboratory on the other side of the world. So you do feel comfortable with that, but you don't feel comfortable getting asking them to eat a whole food diet of meat and fat, which we've been eating for thousands of years, um, even for three months as a trial to see if they have another epileptic episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think some people are, uh, you know, do, do, uh, have a lot of empathy for their, their patients, but, you know, maybe they're just in their experience, it's difficult to get them on it. And, and, you know, the, the, you know, the modality in medicine right now is, you know, and the, and the incentives are such that you're trying to find a product that will, you know, help people, but that you can also sell because that, I mean, that's, you know, that's where people are getting returns, right? You know, it's so like, you're trying to have a business and you're like, okay, what can I do that can help people? What product can I make that can help to help this person? Oh, okay. I figured out this medication and it can suppress seizures. Well, that's a great product, you know, and you're helping people, mm -hmm. you know, telling people not to eat carbs doesn't, doesn't sell a product you know? And so that incentive is just a little different. And so that's why it needs to come from doctors and it needs to come from, uh, you know, other, other sort of health advisors, because that is your product. Your advice is your product, you know? So, so you're giving people proper advice. So that's where it needs to come from. But unfortunately in the medical community, you know, we get taught by people that have these incentives that, that, you know, like Harvard, there was a, there was a study that came out or an article that came out, uh, rather that um, was talking about how basically, you know, their, their professors that were teaching, they were, they were very much in the pockets of these pharmaceutical companies. And like someone in uh, like first year medical uh, student at, at Harvard, you know, asked about the, the side effects of statins, like, you know, and, and the guy like m openly mocked her in uh, class. And uh, he's like, oh my God, uh, you know, basically like, oh, you're just being crazy. Like there's, there are no side effects. This is just perfect. It's only good, only roses. And, uh, you know, they sort of, you know, thought that was a bit, you know, uncalled for, looked it up. This guy is like, you know, on the board of like, you know, all these companies that make statins and like, you know, and, and it has like, you know, ties with like 32 different pharmaceutical companies and, you know, financial ties with them. And so, and then they found that um, there was a grading system 
that uh, basically looks at you know how how financially compromised and ethically compromised are your professors in your medical school with the with the pharmaceutical companies. You know how much of these people have all these besides that they aren't reporting, they aren't telling people about. Um, um, and and you can find it somewhere. It has to be reported at some point. But um, but basically they got Harvard had a had a grade of F, so they were they were they had a failing grade of of their. Uh, you know, uh, financial ties of their professors with the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, the, these are the people teaching, teaching doctors and, like, and yep, this is the treatment. You have epilepsy. This is how you start with these. Are the, I mean, I was never told about a ketogenic diet helping epilepsy when I was in medical school and we were learning about this. We learned about the different classifications of drugs and what they did and how they worked pharmacologically and, and um, you know, physiologically in your body, because that's what you're tested on in the USMLE step one. You're looking at, at physiology, you're looking at pharmacology and you're just, and that's just what you're getting taught. You know, they don't tell you that for 90 years, you, you haven't needed medication except in very extreme circumstances. And so, you know, that's unfortunately uh, how medicine is taught. You know, you're taught that you have a problem, you have a, you have a treatment, you know, and that treatment is a product, you know what I mean? Um, and then there's diet and lifestyle, low, you know, lose weight, blah, blah, blah. But the, the recommendations also go back to these influences from industry, like the sugar companies paying off all these professors, um, you know, like Ansel Keys, like these guys from Harvard, who became you know, the head of USDA, who then put forward the policies. So even those rec recommendations or compromise uh, from 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 uh, uh, these these payoffs and these um, unethical uh, actors. So you know it's difficult, you know, but that's what people but people are trying. They're like, oh yeah, here, here are these recommendations, but they're you know they're also contaminated. But a lot of these things you're just you're taught to prescribe medications. Um, you know, and that, and that's it's, it, it's like asking a stockbroker, should I buy this stock? You know, they'll, <laughs> they'll either say absolutely buy it through me, or no, actually buy this stock through me, or invest in this little fund through me. Where they get a slightly larger commission, um, yeah. and you know, and the farmers get the same thing when they have an agronomist come out to their farm, and they're like, you know, oh, does my topsoil need more fertilizer? Do I need more pesticides? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like people in this local area usually put yeah, why not? a suite of yeah. products. Yeah, I've got some in my truck. I'm, yeah, what a coincidence! Wow. You know? yeah. Yeah. Like, he, tap here. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Um, um, so yeah. So unfortunately, there are incentives, but you know, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if. It, it certainly wasn't taught to me, and obviously I'm not a neurologist, so I don't know if that was, if that's regularly trained in uh, you know in in uh, neuro neurolog in neuro neurology uh, residency. But you know, I, I certainly have spoken to a lot of people that had no idea uh, that that's that that's what it is. Neurologists and uh, and other ones who did, but they just sort of dismissed it by like, oh yeah, but it's really hard to do that. So maybe it was it was relayed to them, you know, that like yeah, this is something that works but it's really hard to make people change their life and, and drop carbs. So they've just basically had that mindset without even trying it, you know, that they're like, oh yeah, well, that was told to me by someone I respect and admire. So like, obviously that's true. So there's, there's no worse, it's not worth wasting your time. Um, but I think it is worth it. I think that, you know, maybe not everyone's going to get, um, get on board, but some will, and it will help those people. And every, certainly every person that I've spoken to that's having problems with seizures, um, you know, that I run into in, in uh, my neurosurgical consults, uh, they're absolutely uh, thrilled to hear about something that could potentially get them off medication and help them not have seizures and can get them driving again and not have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, locking up and, and killing themselves and others. You know, they're very excited to hear that, you know? And so, you know, I don't think that that's as difficult of a hurdle to get over as, as some may think. And then, and then I think the others, <laughs> just unfortunately, just don't know about it. You know, and because we're taught pharmacology, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not, we're not taught, uh, you know, prescriptive um, nu nutritional advice, except for, you know, don't eat fat, don't eat meat, vegetables are good, you know, and so, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's as deep as it gets uh, to the nutritional sciences in, uh, in medicine, in medical school, you know, and it's, and it's wrong, you know, so it's like, you know, um, you know, very not helpful. Mm. All right, that was really well said. Um, thanks for ending there. I think I'll turn it into a clip. And uh, if you've got somebody who you know, I do personally. If you know someone who's got epilepsy, maybe send that clip to them and they can hopefully ask more questions or do a bit more research themselves. Um, yeah, well, and, and, there, and there's plenty. There's, there's plenty of studies out there. I mean, literally like a century's worth. So are, are, there, any, are there any names we should be looking for? Like should, should I be looking at Ben Bigman, 
Piping. Well, yeah, I mean, Ben, ben Bickman is a great place to start. And, um, you know, he's been, he's sort of the guy doing research into, you know, you know, carbs and insulin and how this affects your, your brain and body. Um, and, you know, he's been doing this for over 15 years and um, even, even migraines as well. I was talking to him uh, sort of off the camera as soon as the camera ended. And uh, I was just like, oh, why didn't, you know, you know, why didn't we get this? But, you know, he was saying that, you know, migraines, you know, another neurological uh, disorder is, uh, is very well treated by, um, by being, on, being on a ketogenic diet. And again, the carnivore diet is going to be even better than that because there are known triggers for migraines that are not carbohydrate related, but they do come from plants. And so, you know, just, like, just doing that is going to be better. Sorry. Like, um, seed oil. Caffeine. Well, yeah. yeah um, wow. Maybe I don't know. Um, but like caffeine, you know, caffeine can absolutely, you know, trigger these things and, um, and, uh, dehydration, you know, just simple things, you know, can, can set these things off, but, you know, um, but as far as, uh, ketogenic sort of thing, you know, he's like, Oh yeah. You know, being on a ketogenic diet is absolutely helpful. There, there were studies back in the 1920s, as far back as the 1920s that he was telling me about that had like, a, you know, 90% of people with migraines that went on a ketogenic diet stopped their migraines completely. And the other 10% still had a significant reduction in uh, number and severity of their migraines. So it, it just helps. And so probably that 10% were people who were being triggered by, by other things in plants, not carbohydrate related. Um, so, and then he was saying specifically there, now they just need to sort of be off carbohydrates and in a ketogenic state. Um, you know, they don't even need like the high ketones, like that is more important for people with epilepsy to have high ketones with, with people with migraines. It's just get away from carbs and be in, in a ketogenic state predominantly, you know, when you eat meat and you, you you eat a number of protein amount of protein, your, your blood sugar will blip up a bit and you'll, you know, technically drop out of ketosis transiently, but you know, overall, this is still part of a physiological process. And, and, um, but yeah, so as long as you're not taking in exogenous carbohydrates for migraines, you know, you're good, uh, with people with epilepsy, that's good, but also having higher ketones seems to be beneficial as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can just, you can just jump in the literature. I mean, just go on Google scholar. Everyone has access to that. If you have access to PubMed even better, but just Google scholar will at least bring up uh, things with abstracts and, and you can just look up, you know, ketogenic diet and, and epilepsy, you know, or ketogenic diet, epilepsy, Johns Hopkins, like things will come up and you can, you can do your own research. And, you know, like you said, you know, if, if, you know, people know someone with, with epilepsy or seizures, you know, please share this video with them. You know, this is something that, that will help them. And, you know, if it's something that they can do and they can get on board with it, it will change their life and it will significantly uh, benefit them from a, from a seizure perspective. And then, then you'll get all the other benefits as well. You, it will, it will, you know, heal your body and, 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 and have your body working optimally in every other aspect as well. And it will help their seizures. So it's, it's only a win-win. There are no drawbacks to this realistically apart from like oh but i like eating carbs or whatever that's the same argument as like you know it's like oh you're having health problems you should really stop doing drugs and alcohol yeah but I, oh but i like drugs and alcohol Absolutely. i like smoking yeah, yeah. you know fine I, I i appreciate that you like that and if you're an adult you get to make your own decisions i'm i'm fully on board with that i'm very libertarian when it comes to the people making their own decisions <laughs> with their own bodies but 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 i think a lot of people will look at that and go like I can get off medication. Potentially I can have less seizures. Like I'm going to give that a try and, and it will help them, you know, like even the people that it may not cure completely, you know, it's going to help. It's going to significantly reduce your uh, burden of seizures and it's going to reduce your re reliance on uh, medications as well. And I think that's always a good thing. 100%. All right, Anthony, thank you so much. That was really, really, really good. Yeah. No problem, man. Right, see you guys.